Jesus never codified it in a sense that he just gave us this big checkoff list. All he looked at us and said was this, is there something inside of you that hungers for righteousness? You hunger for holiness. You want to pursue God. You want your life to reflect him. No, you're not perfect. Yes, you will stumble. Undoubtedly, you will seek his forgiveness and have to repent along the way. But hear me when I say this. Is there something in you that hungers and thirsts for righteousness? Because we are living in an era where the church no longer hungers for that. All it hungers for is entertainment. It hungers for a blessing. It, it hungers for maybe a short buzz. It does not hunger for the righteousness of God found in Jesus Christ. And that's the only thing that will save us. I think there's no better time of year than ending one and beginning another. As I've mentioned, that we can begin to retool and reprioritize our life. And I'm hoping that as you have listened and you'll read God's word, and I hope you're here every week for the next several weeks so you can get everything into your system. Because I don't want you turning into a legalist, nor do I want you to be discouraged that somehow or another this is too big uh, too awesome, too overwhelming. Listen, if, it doesn't matter where you are in your journey, whether you're newly in your walk or whether you're a seasoned journeyer with the Lord. Listen, all of us are being transformed from where we're at, from one stage of glory to another. And the series is entitled The Responsibility of Christian Liberty. The Responsibility of Christian Liberty. Get your Bibles out or your technology that carries the Scripture. Open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading very quickly from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 17, just two verses. As we start our new series, The Responsibility of Christian Liberty. This series has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with America. It has nothing to do with your citizenship. Although, maybe we could talk about that because that is a relevant topic. But this series has zero to do with that. We are going to talk about what it means to be free. What does it mean to be free with regards to our relationship to Jesus Christ and how freedom is lived out? What a, what a mature, credible, spirit-filled believer looks like in an age of compromise and convolution and just really craziness. And what I'm going to do is, and for those that could not be here, perhaps they're on the road or they're sick, I'm really going to encourage you, if you have family members that couldn't be here, friends that couldn't be here, we'll try to get the word out. But if they want to keep up, it's going to be one of those series that I'm going to build every week. And so we always put this on our legacy media. So you can go to the website, go to YouTube, and they can catch up. And they're really going to need to catch up or they'll be, they won't be lost. I'll do my best to keep them in the loop, but it will really help if they uh, are able to hear some of the things that I'll share this morning as we build upon it from week to week. I have been probably the last year at least on a personal journey of a couple of important things and this series is being birthed out of this journey and I don't know that I'm going to tell you all the stories about the journey today but I will be telling you stories about the journey along the way but I'm going to lay a little groundwork and I'm going to tell a number of stories this morning and I'm going to tell a lot more in the days ahead that I believe will keep your attention and hopefully will be relevant to you and so let's start by reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 I'm going to begin reading with verse 17. And the title of my message is Living in an Anything Goes Era. Living in an Anything Goes Era. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. But we all, he then says, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed from glory into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Living 
in an anything goes era. Now, I've already mentioned to you, and whenever I teach out of the letters to the Corinthian church, I always mention that this was a church that had twisted and convoluted about everything you could imagine. And I can almost say without exception that no matter what the Corinthians tried to do, they invariably corrupted it. They turned it into something that was never intended by the Lord. And you can read through both letters, go chapter by chapter, and you could see that whether it be their love feasts or their assembling together, the communion table, the gifts of the Spirit, women in ministry, tongues, resurrection, their testimony, uh, personality cults. I already told you they messed up the offering. How could you mess up an offering, for crying out loud? But they messed up the offering. So it should, it should come as no surprise that when they began to teach on the subject of freedom or liberty, that the Corinthians corrupted that as well. And I do have sympathies for the Corinthian Christians because they were the first century believers. They didn't have a lot of history behind them. It was a new church. It was a new movement. It was young. It was bound to have some growing pains, bound to have some problems. But if you add on top of that the sheer darkness of the city of Corinth, it would have challenged any one of us, the most fervent of believers in churches. And I want to talk to you just for a moment about the culture of Corinth because I want you to get a picture of what's going on in Corinth and with these Corinthian Christians. Now, I know there are kids present with us this morning, so I'm going to be as discreet as possible, despite the fact that most of our kids are exposed to things regularly that should be unmentionable. I'm always amazed that people get offended at a pastor saying something unmentionable in church, and then they'll let them watch TV all day long. I mean, it's really interesting to me how it works that way. But nonetheless, I will be discreet. So I'm going to use big words and veiled images so that you parents can elaborate to them later. Corinth was as debased a culture as a culture could get. It was an anything goes type of culture. Nothing was considered too bizarre. Their outlandish promiscuity was to them considered to be a part of normal life. It was sick, actually. To a Corinthian, an intimate relationship with multiple people Anyone, any person at any time was as necessary as eating, drinking, and breathing. They actually linked it to their pagan worship. And if I could tell you the stories of what took place even on the streets, it would make you blush. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that today our culture in America is becoming every bit as debased as it was in Corinth. My wife and I met a young mom at an event recently who told us the story of her kindergartner being trained in a public school here in the Tri-County area and this kindergartner was trained in the intricacies of using a prophylactic birth control device and they practiced in class on a banana. That's our area, the buckle of the Bible Belt. It embarrasses me to say that out loud. It should embarrass the school board of that county. It should embarrass the citizens of the low country. And it should embarrass the church because this kind of thing happens all over our nation regularly and it happens with all of our permission. But the problem at the church of Corinth and to a great extent our problem with the church of America today was an unwillingness and an inability to divorce itself from the values of the culture. You see, the church at Corinth could not separate themselves from their old, selfish, immoral, and pagan ways. So what they did is what we see happening today. They created, which we would really need to say they actually corrupted their own doctrine. So their old, old ways could be assimilated into their new view of Christianity. And they did all this under the banner of liberty. We're free. Now, I want to just share with you what I call two doctrines Christians embrace to justify their compromise. There are two doctrines. I could go through numbers, but I want to give these to you. And again, I'm just laying some groundwork down. I'm going to tell a lot of funny stories along the way. 
But if you don't get the, the foundation, you won't get what's coming in later weeks. So two doctrines that Christians embrace to justify their compromise. The first one is called universalism. Universalism is basically the doctrine that says all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> I mean, literally, you can live like a dog and you can still go to heaven. You can act any way you want to act, do whatever you want to do. It doesn't really matter. You can still behave any way you want and you can still be saved. Now, the church at Corinth was practicing this and they were actually teaching this. In fact, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 29, that rarely gets talked about. Only at Legacy will you see verses like this. It says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Verse 30, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Literally in Corinth, what was going on is that they were baptizing people in proxy for those that had already died. So in other words, you would perhaps present yourself for maybe a granddad or a great uncle or a friend or it could be literally anybody. And on their behalf, you would be baptized in their name in order to be sure that the one who had died would make it to heaven. Now, by the way, just FYI, Mormons still do this. And yes, that means they are universalists. They baptize. That's why they like genealogies. It's because they're baptizing for people getting them into celestial kingdoms in order that they can be all right and okay. Now, in our era, we don't baptize for the dead. However, universalism is becoming a practical doctrine for most people because we refuse to believe that people actually could go to hell. We refuse to believe that salvation actually regenerates people into new beings and it has by way of direct consequence an effect on our behavior. You see, you can't be saved and be you know, translated from an old creature to a new creature without the new creature behaving differently than the old creature acted. So that's why Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 these words. He said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That's important. It doesn't say, but such are some of you says such were some of you but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of our lord jesus and by the spirit of our god and i think we tend to forget that in our current church culture behavior is an indicator of what exactly has happened in your heart now listen because I'm going to get to this and we'll come and cover this some more in future weeks. You are not saved. Hear me. You are not saved by your behavior. Because you can never behave, especially in an unregenerate state, you can never behave in such a way that could produce the righteousness you need to have a relationship with God. So behavior doesn't save us. But your behavior testifies about your salvation. Are you following me? It begins to bear fruit of what you say has taken place in your heart. Now, that's the first problem at Corinth. They began to teach universalism. But number two is probably the most directly applicable. It's what we call, it's a big word, antinomianism. You can walk out of here today and have a word that your neighbor won't know. Antinomianism, posted on the screen, guys. What does that mean? It literally means against law, but the best translation I could give you is this. It means anything goes. Anything goes. And antinomianist believes that you can live any way you want to live. And a Christian's not obligated in any way, shape, or form to any law or restriction that might come to their life. Now that sounds, at first, biblical. But what happens is that it gets twisted as an antinomianist will do 
into beginning to teach or believe that any expectation, including biblical commands, including God's call to his people to some form of obedience, suddenly becomes works. So therefore, a believer is not obligated to embrace it because, you know, Paul said we are saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we say to ourselves, you know, we're saved by grace. We can't work our way to salvation. Therefore, anything I do is considered a work. Listen to me. Work is not to be equated with obedience. Obedience is an expected fruit of conversion. And disobedience is not a kingdom virtue. In other words, God didn't save you so you could go be disobedient. That's why Paul would later write, and I'm just reading to you and trying to put some pieces together in Romans 6. He says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, we're living in our current 21st century American church age in an antinomian era. For the most part, believers do not understand how the law and obedience works within the context of their New Testament faith. And you will hear people say all the time, well, I, you know, you, you can't have an expectation on me because I've been set free. You've not been set free to do just what you want to do. You've been set free to serve God. Now, the church through the years has tried to address these two issues. Now, how does the church try to address it? Now, I call this two overcompensations that the church usually does to embrace or it embraces to combat these two problems. The first one is called sectarianism. Sectarianism. How do you overcompensate for universalism? You've got everybody, everybody's saying anybody's saved, you know, everybody's saved in the end. So, so what happens? Well, sectarianism is what's birthed out of that. You begin to foster the sentiment that we are the only ones who are right. In other words, we've not only made it exclusive with regards to Jesus, but we've made it exclusive with regards to our group. We're the only ones that got this thing down right. And what you foster is specialism. You begin to think that you're the only one of a dwindling few who have the correct view of the will and the heart of God. Now, it's interesting that the Corinthians had that problem because if you'll read the first chapter of the first letter, they had all sorts of personality cults arising. You would have Corinthian believers saying, well, we're of Paul. And others would say, well, we're of Cephas. And then you had the super spiritual group that would say, we're of Jesus. We only follow Jesus. And they were all saying these words, ostensibly, we're it. We're the ones. We've, we've got it all. And again, we're going to talk about these things, but the Lord has been showing me in recent days that an aberration or an overcompensation to combat universalism is, is to say that somehow we're the only ones. And so we sort of develop this mentality of, of, of the righteous few and those few are only us. Let me, let me just say this. John saw in the book of the Revelation, he says, with regards to those who would worship around the throne, of the Lord himself, he said, I saw a number no man can number. There are a lot of people that are going to be in heaven. Uh, so I can number this room. So obviously it's more than us. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven. But the second way the church is overcompensated, trying to battle these things, is through what we have come to know as legalism. How do you compensate for those who refuse to circumscribe their life. How do you compensate for those who live an anything goes kind of life and still say they love Jesus? How do you do that? How do you, how do you, how do you compensate for, for an era where Christians are living really not a whole lot differently than anyone else in the world? Well, what happens is in this overcompensation is you become a legalist and you force people to live by a certain set of man-made rules. Now, we're going, as we talk about liberty, we're going to really delve into this, but I'm laying foundational stuff here. So there's some more stories that are coming your direction. But my wife and I, my wife more than I, but both of us, grew up 
in legalism. Some of you had your forms of legalism, I'm sure, in churches you grew up in. We grew up in the holiness movement. And back in those days, I mean, they, they, they lived tight. You couldn't go to the movies, couldn't go to pool halls, couldn't dance. Jewelry was suspect. There was an old saying the women used to say, if it touched the skin, it's sin. So you can see my wife has been set free from all of those things as far as that goes. <laughs> things like drinking. And then some of these things, and I'm going to get back to this. I mean, some of them were, some of them were righteous attempts at things that had gone wrong, but some of them were silly. You know, open-toed shoes. I just, sleeveless dresses, that's right, I forgot about sleeveless dresses. Not cutting the hair, most of it involved women. Putting it in a bun, not putting on makeup. So all of these things, and, and rules were developed, because, because there was, if we give people the benefit of the doubt, they were trying, in some form or fashion, to, to address, and in so addressing, they overcompensated, trying to address a culture of, of a church that lived an anything goes kind of life. So gratefully, we've both been freed from that legalism. Now, when I say you've been freed from legalism, you've not been freed from obedience. You've not been freed from being sanctified. Some people through the years have felt that I have held too high an expectation of a, of a believer. I've actually, as of late, been called a legalist. It's interesting. Because I want to look at people and say, listen, you don't even know what legalism is. If you think legalism is asking you to come to prayer on time, then you don't get legalism. You just don't get it. So I understand what legalism, I lived in it. Don't, 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 don't somehow write disobedience off to legalism, okay? They think they understand it, but they really don't understand it. So obedience is not the same as legalism. Obedience to the word is not legalism circumscribing your life is not legalism but we are living in a corinthian age so anytime you even preach the word of god and you just read something that's on the page do not commit adultery you'll hear people go you're judging and you're being a legalist that's the age we're living in and then we cut backflips trying to somehow explain to them that we're really not judging and we really do love them. We're just trying to read the Word of God. But we're reaching the time period where all of a sudden what's written in the book can't even be declared because suddenly we're all legalists unless we just read that one word love and then let everyone make up their own definition to it. But the reason people turn to legalism is because of a church that refuses to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And how the Holy Spirit would refine and touch our lives. And so they institute these corporate convictions because people refuse to develop any conviction on their own. Now I'm going to say this clearly and hopefully you'll tell your friends or your neighbors or other church members that will be coming in the weeks ahead. You'll remind them that this is on tape. It's on YouTube. Go to Legacy Media. That pastor said these words. God is against legalism. Because man cannot put a yoke on another man. However, the Lord can put a yoke on you. Don't you think you get away from yokes? You got a yoke. Jesus just said his yoke was easy. And his burden was light. So there's a yoke that you're going to wear. And he may ask you to circumscribe your life in such a way to make you more effective for him. He may ask you to give up some things in order to make you more effective for him. Remember, this isn't about you. It's about him. Remember, that's what happened when you became born again. You gave up your life. And he may say to you certain things that he won't say to anyone else. He may look at you and say, you can't do this anymore. Yes, maybe everyone else gets to, but you don't get to. He may look at you and say, I want you to let this go, or I want you to embrace this. And hear me when I say this, if you're converted and your heart is after him, that will be easy because your highest desire will be to please him. It won't be a problem and it won't be a duty and it really won't be a burden. I mean, there are things that God has asked of me to do and our household to do, and he may not have asked your household to do that. And you may look at me and say, that seems hard. Let me tell you, I don't know that there's anything we do that's all that hard. I mean, if I see a bad TV program, I can turn it. It's not that hard. 
I mean, for some people, you would think it's like, I can't, I can't do this. Are you following me? All right. See, but the church doesn't teach these things anymore because we live in an anything goes era. So what are we to do in a culture and a church where anything goes? We got to understand Christian liberty. See, nobody wants to shackle you with any chain. Nobody wants to put, especially me, I don't want to put some burden on you that's not God. I want you to be able to respond to God and live for God and go all out for the Lord. But our problem is we have not understood what it means to be free. So we've got to understand this thing called Christian liberty. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that the devil's best weapon against a Christian is confusion. Since he, the devil, cannot create or birth anything himself, what he does is he counterfeits things. And you'll see this through the scripture. You'll see it mentioned that there are false prophets and there are false teachers. How many of you know if there is a false prophet, that must mean there are true prophets? You can't have something that's false that doesn't exist. So if it's a false teacher, there must be true teachers. If there's a false gospel, there must be a true gospel. If there are false Christs, there must be what? A true one, right. So you're following me. And all he can do is create confusion by counterfeiting. And so we need to be aware that, that just as he's counterfeited other things, the enemy is now counterfeiting liberty. There is a true liberty and there is a false liberty. And I put on the screen overhead what I have defined as false liberty. And false liberty is living according to the dictates of your carnal nature. That's a false liberty. Now, many people think that's freedom. What freedom to most people means is I have no restraints. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I'm going to sing with Frank Sinatra and Elvis. I did it my way. Isn't that? And everybody stands and claps and gives them an ovation. I did that pretty good, didn't I? Amen. I may start singing solos. You'd be blessed. <laughs> but that's, what, that's how we define liberty. No one's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. I am free. That is a false liberty. I have a pastor friend of mine. He had to call in a, a worker a couple years ago, a worker in his kids' department, that he had suddenly found out that he was secretly, listen to this, a Christian nudist. That's right. Bet you didn't know there was such a thing. Well, he didn't know there was such a thing either. So he began to have this conversation about this. And again, kids are present, so I'll leave the details out. But basically, the reason boiled down to was that he'd been set free from the law of man. He was cultivating the purity of what God originally intended in the garden. If you believe that, you're not just deceived. You're a nut. <laughs> but welcome. I give you that story. Welcome to the new definition of liberty. Now I realize what people do may not be as dramatic as that. But truthfully, we have issues that were stigmatized as little as a decade ago that are now embraced by a vast majority of believers because we're free. I can do anything. I'm free. Jesus set me free. Jesus is cool with everything I do. Listen, we don't understand liberty, freedom. Freedom, as the series has underscored, freedom has a responsibility. Even in our nation, and I promised you this wouldn't be political, but if we see freedom as I get to do what I want when I want and no one's going to tell me what to do, that's called anarchy. And anarchy will destroy us. So... What is true liberty? I want to give you just a couple things here this morning. Just a few things laying the foundation for the weeks ahead. True liberty is number one. Constantly producing a greater transformation. If you've been set free by the Lord, 
fact, that's what Paul wrote in our text. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then he goes into that next verse, and he tells us a little of what that liberty looks like. He says that we are being transformed. Metamorpho. The Greek word literally means that we are constantly changing from one state of glory to the next state of glory. He says we're being transformed from glory to glory. Literally, our lives are reflecting God in greater measure on a constant basis. Now, the reason why that is important to get a hold of is because anyone that is born again, let's say within you know, just a few weeks or months. I mean, no one expects that an ostensibly new believer is going to have a life that is circumscribed or ordered as well as someone who has been walking 30 or 40 years with the Lord. Would you agree that if you're walking 30, 40 years with Jesus, that through your study, your discipline, prayer, obviously uh, hearing God, all the things that should be taking place in your life, that, that God would or should have forged you or formed you in such a way that it would be uh, fairly reasonable to expect that there would be a greater reflection of God's glory in your life than in that new believer's life who may not know as much or studied as much or had as much time under his belt. So there is this continuum that certainly exists that someone who's new to all of this is going to have time in order for God to work on them and be discipled and to be helped along the way as they are being transformed from glory to glory to glory. And even those that have years under their belt are still going to be transformed from glory to glory to glory. The problem, again, has become we've got people with years under their belt, but they look sometimes they look worse than they did before they were saved. The word transformed literally means to be changed into another person. It, it carries with it the idea of a caterpillar. You know how it works? A caterpillar cocoons himself, and then there's a moment he breaks out of the cocoon, and what does he turn into? A butterfly. A butterfly. He turns into something that's totally different than what he was. That's what the Scripture means when it talks about transformation. It means that we go into the booth one way, and we come out another way. We go before God... As, as one who is broken uh, in sin uh, under the hand of judgment, we seek God for forgiveness. We seek his grace. We seek his mercy. He comes and by his Holy Spirit, he gives us a new heart. He regenerates us. He justifies us. He adopts us into his kingdom and, and he raises us up. And suddenly we are not the same person we were prior to meeting him. We are a brand new creature. I've listened to people Use all sorts of illustrations. And, and it's not as if you're just given a new, you know, you're the same old person just with a new set of clothing on. You're a brand new person. Something that's never existed before. You've been freed from the old man to become the new man. And so that freedom involves greater transformation. So as you're on this journey... Just understand, God will be working on you. He will be forming you, forging you, disciplining you, chastising you, encouraging you, lifting you up, empowering you, helping you, everything imaginable because his sole purpose is to conform you into the image of his son. That's what it's kind of all about, folk. It isn't about getting your next blessing. It's about looking more like Jesus. Amen. Number two, what does true freedom look like? Well, true freedom asks the responsibility questions. If I've been freed to serve the Lord, in fact, the Bible says that, that truthfully, when I was in slavery, I was in slavery to sin. This is the unique thing. This is the way deception works. There are people, let's just say, the party crowd who will party every weekend and they'll say to themselves, I'm not going to give up my partying, you know, to go follow the Lord. And they think they're free as they party their way through life. That's the deception. You're not free. You're enslaved. You're enslaved to your nature. You're enslaved to your friends. You're enslaved to the way the world thinks. You're enslaved to the fact that you can't face the world with a clear conscience, that you have to anesthetize it with whatever drugs or, or buzz of alcohol you've got to put inside of you. you you're anesthetizing yourself. You're, you're not free. You think you're free. 
Satan makes you think you're free, but actually you're not free. It's the same thing he did with Adam and Eve when, when God said you could have anything you want in the garden, but this one fruit you can't partake of. And the enemy looked at him and he said, you're not really free. He said, see this, see this, let's just use it as an apple. See this apple? He won't let you have this. So see, you're really not free to do anything you want. And the minute they took the apple, thinking they were operating in freedom, was the moment they became enslaved for the rest of their lives. That's exactly what happens. And so we have to begin to understand that there are questions, there are responsibility questions that we have to ask as we walk along. I'm just giving you some examples. For example, what does my Lord expect of me in this situation that I'm in? How do I represent him? How do I represent his kingdom as an ambassador? Am I doing something that Jesus would have been found doing? Can I see Jesus doing this? Because why would I do something my master wouldn't do? Would he go there? Why would he go there if he went there? Am I going there for the same reasons Jesus would have gone there? How am I responsible for new believers who look up to me and are watching me or a world that's watching me? How, how, what do I do when I go to the office and everyone knows I'm a Christian and they're watching and they're waiting? How am I going to make decisions? How am I going to react? How am I going to do this particular thing? Would this make someone stumble? I could go on and on and on, but I hope you're getting the point. True liberty asks these questions. We watch celebrities and because of their fame and their wealth, I think at times we covet what we perceive as freedom to do as they please. Look at these rich people. Look at these famous people. They can buy what they want, do what they want, marry whom they want, divorce whom they want, you know, date whom they want, discard whom they want. But do you understand, if you'll take just a short look, that there is an incredible price to their false freedom? Think of it this way. A celebrity can go nowhere without paparazzi taking pictures. I don't know if you've ever been in a grocery store checkout line and you see all the tabloids that are written there. Wouldn't you love your face to be plastered on all of that? You know why their faces are plastered on all of that? Is because in their false freedom, they never ask a question. They never ask, should I be doing this? Should I be there? Is this what God would have me to do? Listen, if we would ask righteous questions, we probably wouldn't be on the covers of worldly magazines because the slightest thing they do goes into the tabloid, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to give everybody here a picture you've never had before. You are a kingdom celebrity. Every one of you here is a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Are you following me? I mean, in other words, Jesus has said that you and him get to sit together in heavenly places right now. God has called you a son or he has called you a daughter. You're a rich, you're a rich kid because you're in relationship to the king of kings. You are a celebrity. And Satan is taking pictures. And he would like nothing better than to embarrass you. And so you need to ask yourself all the questions. Is this something, you know, the what would Jesus do bracelet, which isn't half bad, but maybe you ought to have a bracelet that says, what did Jesus do? Or, you know, or, or would this be something I'd drag him? A lot of times I, I will ask that. I'll say, is this, hey, Jesus is with me. Am I going to drag him here really? Amen. Number three, what is true freedom? It is not the freedom to do as one pleases, but to do as God wills. It is not the freedom to do as one pleases, but to do as God wills. There's a subtle deception that most people fall into, and it's with regards to who really controls each one of us. For most people, they think that they control themselves. But truthfully, this is how it works. Either a sin nature controls you or the divine nature controls you. That's your choice. What controls you? Now, there are times because of restraint, we can keep our carnal-based natures from doing absolutely the over-the-top stuff. But truthfully, something's controlling us. So your freedom in Christ was to allow your creator and your redeemer to fully manifest the purposes and the goodnesses of God in your life, not so that you could live life selfishly. And that's a problem, again, because we teach things from a selfish perspective. This is what God will do for you. If you'll do this, God will do this. You'll be blessed. You'll be helped. And, and does God... 
Does God want to help his people? Certainly. Are there verses in there that, that talk about God sustaining his people? Absolutely. But hear me when I say this. We focus in on that which is about us instead of focusing in on that which is about him. He grants us the desires of our heart because our heart has been transformed and now we have his heart. It's not that God is granting the desires of your selfish nature. He's granting the desires of a heart that he has transformed inside of you because your heart wants what ultimately he wants. And finally, number four, and we're going to leave it here and pick it up next week. Number four, living in an anything goes era, what is true freedom? It fights the God of this world, not embraces him. And you see, it's a little G. You know, Paul would tell the Corinthians, he said that the God of this world. Now, Psalm 24 says something interesting. It says that the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. So everything in the earth was designed for a purpose unto God in order to reflect and to give him glory. But unfortunately, what has taken place is that while the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, Satan, or the little g, God of this world, and that word world actually means you could put in their world system, cosmos, the way the world is ordered, the way the world works. He's the God of the way this world works. And our problem is, is instead of fighting our enemy, we start embracing him. True liberty is not to join the ranks of the enemy to undermine the cause of the gospel. And I'm going to be honest as we begin to just open this up with some foundational stuff here. I struggle. I personally struggle with self-identified Christians. Let's just take, for example, artists who are singers actors and celebrities I struggle with these people who give testimony of Jesus being in their life and yet their lives promote everything Jesus died to set us free from well they they love the Lord but they're struggling well okay they're struggling but that doesn't mean they have to get up on a stage and what is it twerk or twerp or if you're what is that, twerp, twerp? What is it? I don't even know what it is. I, I, I know one thing. My daughter ain't going to be doing it. I know that much. If I, was, if I was her dad, I'd have been on that stage. I don't care what age she'd have been. She, she, she loves Jesus. She's just struggling. Well, that's obvious. But you're undermining the gospel. How could that be your heart? You're judging. No, I'm not. I just, I'm a fruit inspector. I don't know. I don't know the gift of twerk. Is that something in the scripture? I've not seen that one yet. Are you uncomfortable? Why? It's the era we live in. I'm just saying what's out there. And we all know it's out there. And yet when I say it, it's like, can he say that? My God, we're watching it. We're paying for it. We venerate it. We worship it. We let our kids listen to it. We turn it on the television. Say, your old Nazarene ways are coming back. No, they're not. My godliness is coming back to me. I want godliness to come back to his church. I know it can't be legislated. I get that. And we're going to get to that point. In fact, you're going to hear pastors say some things with regards to liberty that are probably going to make you go tilt because you're going to think I'm a whole lot tougher on some things than probably I am. But I'm telling you this, that there comes a moment that we as believers have to get before God and not look at how little we can do and get by, but Lord, how much can I give and go forward? We have churches revolving around celebrity. We're sowing into a next generation a philosophy of the flesh that folks will destroy them. We're setting them up for destruction. My freedom demands that I challenge the God of this world. I'm going to challenge the enemy at every crossroad. I'm going to challenge him. 
that he is not going to be able to deceive and seduce and to destroy without a fight. I am to fight his influence. I'm not to embrace it. I'm to challenge everything that Satan promotes and he stands for. I'm to fight that. I mean, it doesn't mean we get up every morning and we just, you know, we're just taking swings at it. I mean, there's, there's ways to do this. But I'm just simply saying we certainly don't venerate it and embrace it. But here's where I have to leave you today, and it's why you've got to come back next week. Because the question arises, how do you address the problem and walk the appropriate walk with the Lord without falling into false liberty or overcompensating into that which at times is almost bad, is bad. God's not calling us to be sectarian. He's not calling us to be legalists. So we know there's false liberty. We know that he calls us to a true liberty. But how in the world do we walk this out? And that's why I told you that really the subtitle of the series should be this. Maturity is harder than you think. Because you see, a pastor or a man can't give you this big list of do's and don'ts and just tell you to follow it. Number one is, for most people in the era we live in, their heart wouldn't even be in that. They'd be gone so fast. They'd be like an Alabama bootlegger on a Saturday night. Poof, they're gone. But we got we to somehow grab hold of the fact that God is calling us to a maturity. He's not calling us to a list. He's calling us to a maturity. He's calling us to a walk. He's calling us to a journey. He's calling us to wake up. He's calling us to connect some dots, to not be naive anymore. To not be silly. To not do the things that we know we just, we're just, we're being silly and stupid. And he's calling us to awaken. That's what Paul said. It is high time now that you awaken from your darkness. We need to awake. If you say you've been set free, then understand what that freedom is. And if you say, I don't know that that's in me, then I got good news for you. I still know a Jesus who sets the captives free. And he will set you free. But the question is this. If you have truly been set free by the Lord, do you understand the responsibility you have with regards to that freedom? Because, folks, listen to me, we're living in an anything goes era. And I like what one friend of mine said one time. I think I've, I've hijacked it. And it's this. Bad becomes good because worse comes along. Isn't that true? The things w which we in one era thought were bad are now okay because, my God, look what's happening now. And we just continue to slide a direction into destruction. I'm not going to, see, and that's where we're ultimately going to get to. I'm not codifying a list. Don't you worry. I'm not codifying anything. I'm just simply asking you, at what point, at what point do we, as the people of God, take responsibility for our liberty? That's a fair question, don't you think? 